Thank you, thank you. I love being in this room because this is where so much happens in this place. I have the honor of, I mean, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Chris Vallotton. Uh, he hired me, so thank you, Chris, for that. Uh, and I stayed because of Bill, so it's both. It's both Bill and Chris together. And Danny Silk has changed my life just about as much as Jesus. So, uh, <laughs> It's the afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm excited to, for what Jesus has in store for us. Uh, if I could get my East Coast fellow East Coasters to shout, come on, East Coast. I love how the, the West Coast, they have this little saying, West Coast, best coast, because it rhymes or something. You know, only people that are insecure about their upbringing have to say those things, because anyone from the East Coast knows what the best coast is. Anyway, take the hand of your neighbor. We're gonna pray. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you're in this place. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would increase your presence, that you would increase the awareness of who you are on each of our lives, God. Holy Spirit, I ask for the gift of wisdom and revelation to open up the word of God to us today. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would anoint our hearts, that you'd anoint our ears to hear and our hearts to respond to your voice, Holy Spirit. We honor you in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you guys to head and we're gonna jump right in because we have a little bit of time together, but I want to make the best use of our time. Matthew 4. I love talking about Jesus. I think that's probably why you guys are here. It's the central topic of open heavens, amen? We live in an open heaven because of Jesus because of what he did. And I wanna talk actually about the life of Peter today and how the life of Peter is a beautiful picture of redemption. How many can identify with Peter sometimes? That man, he was such an encouragement to us all. <laughs> if you're having a discouraging day because you didn't quite hit the mark, just think about the Apostle Peter. And so starting in Matthew 4, it says, now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. I love this simple command of the Lord that all of us obviously responded to is that Jesus has been walking by and he calls us out and he called us first, that we didn't find him, that he chose us before the foundation of the earth actually says in Ephesians 1, talks about the kind intention of the Lord in choosing you. And so you're in this room today, not because of what you've done or what you've earned, but simply because Jesus said, your name, come follow me. And you dropped whatever that was, you laid down in surrender, and you have been on this journey with him. Maybe it's been five months, maybe it's been five years, maybe it's been since you were five years old. No matter what, we are all saying yes to the follow me every day, the follow me. And so Peter goes on this crazy journey with Jesus. He's still trying to figure out who Jesus is and how many of you are on that journey as well. You're still actually figuring out who Jesus is. That's actually, uh, one of my end time uh, theories, so this is not from the Bible, and I'm taking a risk saying this on live TV, but my end time theology is not, this isn't actually theology, my end time imagination is this, that we are so beautiful and have been created in his image, and that he loves people so much, he creates his image over and over and over and over again in the race of humanity until the full expression of his image is released and then he'll come back. 
That's just totally made up in my imagination, but it actually helps me to identify with the image of God in each human being. The image of God, the calling that he is so personal. He, he says each of our names and he calls us beautiful and he calls us to himself. And so Peter feels the calling of the Lord and he gets drawn to him. The inexplainable of why he would leave everything is that the, the, the magnitude of, of how beautiful Jesus was must have spoke to his spirit, right? So he goes on this journey and he's trying to figure out who Jesus is just like all of us are trying to figure that out. That's why we have the body of Christ is because it actually shows us what Jesus is like. Okay. So Peter is there for the Sermon on the Mount. He's getting to hear all of this revelation. He's getting to ask questions. He's following Jesus. He's with him. He's, he's seeing lepers healed. He's leaning in. He's, Peter's like, okay, this is interesting. Is this really the Messiah? This has got to be going on in his mind. The, the Messiah that he's been waiting for, because remember, Peter is Jewish, and he's been raised his entire life that they are looking for the Messiah to come. And so in the back of him, his mind, I'm imagining that he is wondering, okay, I'm watching this Jesus. He must really be who he says he is. He must really be the Son of God. He's watching him heal the lepers. He's watching him, even his own mother-in-law. I mean, that's a miracle, right? He must have loved his mother-in-law. That's a good word. You should love your mother-in-law. <laughs> and so Peter is there. He's on the Sermon Mount. He's helping with the feeding of the 5,000. He's literally watching the bread multiply. He's literally watching the miraculous through the hands of Jesus. He's seeing all this happen. And then Jesus, what is also he does, he calls the 12 to himself and he then gives his authority that's on him to the disciples, and they start doing the stuff. And they come back to Jesus, oh my gosh, can you believe what's happening through us? And Jesus is like, yep, that's the plan. That's the plan. And so Peter is watching this. He's experiencing this. He's, he's having relationship with Jesus. He's getting to ask him questions. He's getting to, to lean into his purpose. And then Peter gets into a boat. How many know that this is a very famous story? Peter gets into a boat. Now, this is the second time he's been in a boat. Because the first time he was in a boat, Jesus came when the disciples were freaking out and Jesus was sleeping. Jesus got up, calmed the waves. Well, the second time that it talks about them being in a boat, Peter sees the Lord walking towards them. This is after the feeding of the 5,000. And Peter's like, if that's you, Lord, tell me to come. And what does he do? Jesus says, come, Peter gets out of the boat and begins to walk on water, right? And what happens is Peter gets afraid because the waves start coming up. Well, he already has a revelation that Jesus can calm the waves, right? So this is his second experience of being in a storm with Jesus, and he begins to sink, and Jesus rebukes him. Can you imagine being obedient, uh, getting out of a boat, walking on water, and you start to sink? And Jesus rebukes you, oh, you have little faith. <laughs> Why did you doubt? That would pierce my heart. If Jesus said, I mean, I'm, I would probably be like, Lord, I literally got out of the boat and walked on water. <laughs> and now, 10 seconds later, you're saying, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Because what he's trying to do is cut off the mindset that Peter was carrying of who Jesus was really was. Because Peter had seen with his own eyes already the miracle of what Jesus could do over the waves. And he's saying, oh wait, you're not getting it yet. I got to cut that off so that you have a true understanding of who I really am. And so then Peter, oh Peter, I love this. This is, he's so encouraging. He's just so encouraging. So then Matthew 16, so they Peter's sitting through the different parables. In Matthew 16, this very, very, very famous verse is when Jesus is walking with his disciples. He turns to them all and he says, who do people say that I am? It's not that Peter, I'm sorry, it's not that Jesus needed the approval of the disciples or was even wondering, but he wanted, he was, he was up to something. And Peter says the very, very, very profound words, you are the Christ the son of the living God. He got the revelation. and Jesus even said, you didn't come up with that revelation yourself, but my father gave it to you. And I tell you this, 
Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, right? Very significant, prophesying over Peter's destiny, prophesying over who he will become. And it wasn't just the revelation that, that, that Peter got on who Jesus was. He was also prophesying what Peter's role would be in the church one day. It's twofold. And so Peter receives these amazing words like, I've been called out by the Lord. How many of you were highlighted today? And you're like, I've been called out. Favor has, I've been highlighted. The highlighter of the Holy Spirit has just been over my life. So Peter is highlighted and he's like, I knew it. I totally knew I would be the rock of the church. I knew it all the way. And thank you, Jesus, for saying it in front of the disciples so they would all know. And so, uh, 10 seconds, I don't actually know, but how I read it, because it takes me 10 seconds to read from that passage to the next. 10 seconds later, when Jesus begins to explain how he must suffer and die, it says that Peter pulled Jesus aside. He just had the revelation, this is the Son of God. He pulls him aside and rebukes him. I don't know about you, but that is guts. That's taking a risk. That was more risk than getting out of the boat, was rebuking Jesus. Because you just had the revelation he's the son of God. And now you think, because actually Jesus invited relationship. He invited discussion. He invited questions. He's not scared of our questions. I don't think he appreciated the rebuke because Jesus in turn rebukes him strongly and says, get behind me, Satan, for you don't have the mind of God, but the interests of man. He wasn't calling Peter Satan. He was calling that mindset demonic. And so what is, what is Jesus doing? He's literally, he's pruning the mindset of Peter along the way and all the while believing in him. Think about how much belief carried Peter. Think about how much belief carries you that you're here in this season in your life. Who has believed in you to get you to where you are today? Who has believed in you to get you to where you are today? Because we all have somebody, and if you don't have a person, you have him. That before the foundation of the world, he knew you. He formed you, he laid out your life, and he chose you even when you were far away. For he loved us first. It's always how it's been, and it's always how it's gonna be. And so I love how Jesus brings it back to the reality of who he is. And then, after that strong rebuke, what does Jesus do? He reinstates his belief in Peter. He takes him out up to the mountain of transfiguration. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were the Lord and you knew the people that you wanted to surround you, yourself with, and you knew that not too far down the road, this Peter is gonna betray you, would you take him to the most intimate place with your father to be completely exposed in the glory of who you are the Mount of Transfiguration. I'll tell you what most of us would do is say, no way. But see, Jesus looks at our life and he doesn't treat us according to even where we currently are at. He treats us for where and for who he is, not even for who we are. He treats us out of his goodness, not our goodness. Not our perfection. He treats us according to his perfection. So he knows that if we can see his perfection and if we would behold him, we will become like him. And so he takes Peter and the gang up to the transfiguration. And Peter, God bless him once again, he starts talking. And he's saying, anybody know people that talk before they think? So... It's totally not me. I've never done that <laughs> within the last 20 minutes. No. So, Peter, this should encourage you. All of you, this is the most encouraging word you'll, you'll hear. Is that Peter starts talking. He says, oh, my gosh, I know. I know what to do. We should build little tabernacles. We can all stay here. This is a way cool place. It's going to be us 
Yes, God, let's live on the mountaintop. He just forgot that Jesus told him that he's going to have to suffer and die. And Peter thinks, no, 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 we can all live here. It's going to be awesome. And it says that the voice of the Lord, while Peter was speaking, overshadows him. It's like, you can stop talking now. <laughs> Once again, it's about my son, not you. This should encourage you. This will break shame off of your life in like 10 seconds. So, so, they, <laughs> so they come down the mountain. I mean, here we go. Now on their way down the mountain then, he's teaching them, he's leading them, and here they come. I'm skipping, you know, for the, for the sake of time, I wanna skip forward to some stuff. So they get to the, to the Last Supper, and we know John talks about how Jesus, knowing all authority had been given to him, he took a towel, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. And it says that Peter <laughs> rebukes Jesus again. <laughs> no, Lord, don't wash my feet, because that was the servant's job. And he didn't quite understand that even though Jesus had taught the parables, whoever wants to be the greatest must become the least. And he was now demonstrating his parables, right? And so Peter's like, no, you can't. And he goes, if, if I don't wash your feet, you'll have no part of me. And Peter's like, then wash my whole body. <laughs> he goes to the extreme, which isn't too far off when the Lord sometimes chastens us. We go to the extreme to try to prove that we're obeying when it's not what he actually asks us to do. So it's really important that we under, understand the nature of who Jesus is and not just hear the command. And so, so Jesus, I, here's the deal. This is not the story of Peter. This is the story of how good Jesus is. And so Jesus is so patient. So he, he washes his feet, you know. She says, hey, do this. This is a good thing for you guys to do for each other. And then he goes, and he sit, he's kicking it with the disciples, and he lays this blow on them. One of y'all is going to betray me. Just let you know. One of y'all is the mole. <laughs> I know it because I'm God. And they all start to debate. And then Peter, he's like, listen. All I know is, even if all of these guys, pointing at the disciples, betray you, I will never betray you. These suckers, they might. Me, not a chance. And P Jesus, being so patient, looks at Peter and says, actually, you're going to deny me three times. Tonight, before the rooster crows, that's how weak sauce you are. No, he didn't say that. That was not Jesus. <laughs> I mean, like, can you imagine? Uh, I can't even imagine if Jesus were to tell me face to face, you are going to deny me tonight. Oh, my gosh. Talk about walking through shame. Okay, so... So what happens is he goes, come on, boys, let's go pray. So Jesus and the disciples, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. You guys all know what happened, is that he asked them to stay and pray with him. They were just told they're all going to run away and betray him. They're all going to flee. And he says, let's go pray. And they all fall asleep. They must have had a lot of wine at the Last Supper because they're all really drowsy. And so they go... <laughs> I'm a logical person, so I'm like, logically. So they, I'm not saying that, that, that they were drunk. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying. Or they were tired from a lot of teaching, Bill. Do you ever get tired from a lot of teaching, you know? <laughs> like some of you in the afternoon, you're like, I've heard three sermons. I can't take another one. So just bear with me. But they, they fall asleep. Jesus comes back. He actually calls Peter out. Peter, why are you guys sleeping? Will you not stay awake with me? My, and they keep falling asleep. 
And then, you guys all know what happens, the guards come, and Peter takes out his sword and cuts off the high priest's slave's ear. Once again, not having the mind of Christ. Jesus <laughs> looks at Peter again. After how many rebukes and how many adjustments and how many messes, takes the ear, cleans up another Peter mess, puts the ear on and says, this isn't how it's going to be. This is not the way. I don't know how many times I'm going to keep telling you. How many here the Lord's ever had to tell you something more than one time? Like today. I'm He is more patient than we think. He believes in us more than we could ever imagine. And so, cuts off the ear, the guards come, what happens? All of the disciples scatter, including Peter, who just told Jesus he would never do what the other suckers were going to do. And he did it. And so he goes, and you guys all know the story, is that Peter sits around the fire. And it says that the first person that asks him if, if he is with Jesus is a slave girl. The second is a servant, and the third is a bystander. Now, if you had been walking with the king of kings and the glorious Jesus, the son of God that you got by revelation, of who he was, would a slave girl, a servant, or any bystander be able to convince you that they actually had power over you? See, Peter didn't just deny Jesus to the high priest. That's not who he denied him to. He denied the Lord to a mere slave, which isn't far off from what happens when we listen to the voice of bondage and slavery and accusation that the fear of man causes us to forget that we serve the king of glory that holds our life that no slave, servant, or bystander could ever convince us differently. And so it's interesting that that whole piece of royalty that Peter writes about later on in his books was something he had to face, is that he let that servant-slave mindset get the best of him. How many here that's ever happened to you? You just forgot who the king of glory was. And that's okay, because he still knew that you would forget, and he still is going to remind you who he is. And so, Peter, the rooster crows, and it says that he wept, wept bitterly. He was so distraught by what he had, the prophecy that he had fulfilled, ouch, the words of Christ. And so, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. We know that Jesus, hallelujah, did go to the cross. He didn't need Peter to accompany him. He, it was his own choice. He went to the cross. He died. He resurrected. And it says that he appeared to his disciples. Sorry, one, one thing. Is that John and Peter ran to the tomb because the women, the women had declared, which is always good. You don't want to get the word out. You just tell women, we will get it out. And so the women got the word out. It's so true. There's a women army raising up. We already know that. It's been happening for centuries. Holly, Hollywood didn't start that movement. The heart of the father started that. So, um, just side note. Um, so, Peter needs to face Jesus. He is so tore up, and he wants to see and he, he obviously is convinced of how good Jesus is because if Peter really was going to let shame and mistakes and, and, the fat, and his betrayal disqualify him, he would have never ran to that tomb. He would have hid in a cave in Egypt. But Peter knew 
how good Jesus was at restoring people. He had watched him do it for three years. And he took another risk. He walked out of the boat another time by running to that tomb. Because he knew the Jesus he was going to meet was going to love him, was going to accept him. He had no doubt that when he ran to that tomb, the kind of man he was going to meet. Because he had already seen him in his resurrected state before on the Mount of Transfiguration. He knew what he looked like. He knew who he really was. Even if he had a moment of forgetting who Jesus was and who he was, he knew he could always run back. And so he ran to the tomb, says that they meet the Lord, and then Jesus begins to appear to the disciples. And then the interesting thing, if you guys want to turn with me to John 21. In verse 1, after these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, which is right next to, which is the Sea of Galilee. And he manifested himself in this way, Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel and Canaan, and the sons of Zebedee and the other two disciples, which is so sad that they didn't name their names. Anyway, so Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Do you know that Jerusalem and the Sea of Galilee are actually 76 miles apart? That's not, you know, so the resurrection happened, and then they go all the way, 76 miles. That's a deliberate choice to go back to an old way of life. And so they said to him, we also will come with you. And they went out to go fishing, and that night they caught nothing. You guys know the story. Then Jesus comes along and says, put your nets on the other side. You get a great fish. That's great. And this is another time. It says that when Peter saw that it was the Lord, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard it, he put out his outer garments and he threw himself into the sea. This time he wasn't, he didn't even care about walking on water. He just needed to get to Jesus. And the other disciples, they came in on a boat. So Peter is just, he, he has to make things right with the Lord. He, he is driven because he, he is, his intimacy with the Lord is absolutely the most paramount thing in his life that he wants to have restored, that relationship. And then Jesus says, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to ask him any questions. It's like sitting with quiet people at, at at the table, nobody, nobody asks. And so Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish and likewise. And now this is the third time that Jesus manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when he had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And what is he doing? He's pointing to the disciples whom, whom Peter had claimed that even though these guys, they're going to deny their love for you, I'm not. And Peter brings it, I'm sorry, Jesus brings it back around. He says, do you really love me more than these guys? He's about to break the comparison that Peter had been walking in. And Peter responds like this. He says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he leaves out his comparison, and that's the last time in the book of John that he compares himself. And then it says, feed my lambs. So Jesus goes through the restoration of Peter. And this, I'm telling you this entire story for my first point. <laughs> I don't even have points, I'm just joking, but. So Jesus walks Peter through the restoration. This is a very common sermon, but I want to actually bring you to this. In verse 18, truly, truly, I say to you that when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you to where you do not wish to go. Now when he had said this, 
He signified what kind of death that, that would Peter would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to Peter, follow me. See, what is Jesus doing in this moment? Jesus is doing a couple things. First of all, he is prophesying to Peter that once you did betray me, but from this point on, you will be so faithful to me that you will glorify me in your death. That you will have the same type of death that I led because that is how faithful you're going to be from this point on. He was prophesying into Peter's future. And then the second thing he does is that he literally redeems the entire life of Peter because he says at the Sea of Galilee, the very place where Peter was originally called and originally laid down everything, he brings him back full circle. And he says, I don't even care. I'm hitting the reset button. At the Sea of Galilee, you come follow me. And at that point, Jesus redeems all of Peter and all that he had done, all that he had betrayed, all of the comparison, all of the arrogance, all of the mindsets, everything. He said, listen, just follow me. And we know that Peter let the full work of redemption happen in his life. You know how we know that? It's because in a few short days, actually it was a couple months, it says that Peter stood amongst the brethren. This is Acts 1 verse 15 that he stands up in the midst of his brethren, and he says, we need to pick a new apostle because Judas betrayed, and we need to pick someone. It says that if, I'm telling you what, if Peter would not have experienced the fullness of redemption, he would have never had the confidence to take leadership when leadership was needed. To step into his true call, if he would have been walking in shame, walking in regret, walking in disappointment, walking in just confusion over why did I do that? If he would have been wishy-washy back and forth, caring about his mistakes, caring about all the ways he let the disciples down, he did it in the midst of his disciples, which also shows me that the disciples truly believed that redemption in Christ was full because they treated him as a leader in their life, even after the way he denied the Lord and he ran and he was a coward, that all of the mistakes, all of the arrogance, all of the comparison, being called out, tell, t Peter literally said, I'm better than all of you guys. And yet they followed him. And yet they turned around and said, Jesus has completely restored you and he's completely restored us. And it gave Peter the confidence to know that his righteousness was not what it was about. It was about being hidden in the righteousness of Christ. And the disciples were convinced of this because they followed him. They followed Peter. And then this is amazing because Jesus always fulfills his word. He's, what happens in Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is poured out. And it says, then Peter stood up. This is the second time where it says Peter stood up. Peter stood up and began to preach. What did he preach? He preached Matthew 16, the revelation of who Jesus is. And that was the rock that Jesus built on that day of Pentecost. He fulfilled his word in Peter's life. Because Jesus will always fulfill his word in your life. If you actually allow redemption to fully work in you, you will Do you believe redemption is for you? Not the world. It says, for God so loved the world. You live in the world. And until we start making redemption personal, It'll become just theology and theory and not where it gives us the ability to with confidence stand before the throne of grace, knowing that if we ask that he will give us freely mercy and grace in our time of need. Think about it. How much is redemption at work in every area of your life? That you can now walk in confidence. Some of you, there's moms in this room that you are not stepping fully into motherhood because of regret you have on the way you treated your children when they were little. 
and you're always holding back, you're always unsure, you're not really, can I be in my kid's life, can I not, because I made so many mistakes when they were little, I don't know how, I mean, I feel strongly right now on this. And some of you, in, you have to let redemption, you have to let Jesus, see Jesus restored intimacy and purpose on that beach day. That beach day was about intimacy, sharing that meal, and restoring purpose as well. It's always intimacy and purpose. How much redemption is on our lives? I mean, there's so many times where I'm just like, oh God, I don't have confidence for lots of things. I don't have confidence to, to I, I actually don't enjoy speaking to strangers. Because I'm like, I like people I know. Because they understand me when I say something stupid. <laughs> so if I don't let redemption into my thoughts and the way I process life, I will not have confidence to fully step into what God's called me to. Some of you, you're, you're so insecure in how you make business decisions that you're not letting Jesus redeem that, that horrible business deal that you had and that you totally missed it in. And if, if you don't let Jesus redeem that, you're never going to step fully into the confidence to make the right business deals. This isn't just about ministry. It's about everyday life. It's about who you are as a wife. It's about who you are as a brother. It's about who you are as a daughter. It's about who you are as a parent. That's life. Only 3% of the church are clergy, or whatever you call us. <laughs> and so it has to become personal. And so I want you guys to go ahead and, I only have a, two more minutes, but I want to do just some ministry because I was really feeling like regret and disappointment for just, it doesn't even have to be sin. Just regret, any level of regret or disappointment in your walk with the Lord, I want you to go ahead and stand. Any level of regret or just disappointment, go ahead and stand. When you hear the story of Peter, you're like, oh wow, I guess I didn't mess up that bad. I didn't tell a slave girl that I didn't know Jesus. So that's like really high bar, right? I'm pretty sure everything else is a lot smaller. And God doesn't really measure, right? Go ahead and close your eyes, because I'm going to read something over you guys. This is the book of 2 Peter. So Peter wrote this later on in his life. And this is what Peter says. I'm going to speak over you. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you will become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. For this very reason, applying all diligence in your faith, supplying moral excellence and in your moral excellence knowledge and in your knowledge self-control, your self-control perseverance and godliness and in your godliness brotherly kindness and in your kindness love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make sure about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. So right now, all across this room, 
we know that Jesus Christ is perfect. We know that John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And today, what I want you to do is actually receive the gift of redemption over whatever you're having regret, whatever you're having disappointment. We, a lot of times, take a lot of time to tell the Lord what we've done, but actually, we need to take more time of him telling us about his choosing us, about him communicating his belief in us, about him restoring us so that we can receive mercy and grace. So right now, I want you to just visualize whatever layer of regret, whatever layer of disappointment, whatever layer of shame, whatever layer of worthlessness or, or betrayal or pity uh, or fear that you're feeling. And you're just going to write it on a piece of paper in your imagination. Just write it down. Now I want you to just simply put it in the fire of his presence. Put it in the fire of his presence. Just let all that regret go, let all that shame go, let all that fear go. And I want you to just receive redemption right now. Receive mercy, receive grace to cover you. Receive his goodness to cover every area of your life right now. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Yeah. Thank you, God. Just take a minute. Okay, and we're going to do some, one more thing. Is I want you to put, put your hand on your neighbor because it says that they, I mean, they really actually worked redemption out in community, guys. They saw each other fall and they saw each other get back up again. And so right now, we just thank you, Father, for the body of Christ, that we would be able to demonstrate redemption with the people around us that we would be able to receive love, that we would be able to fully step into, to stand up and step into all that you have for us, God. That we would fulfill the words on our life, that we would see the promises of God, that we would see the manifestation of your goodness, God. And Lord, that we would be able to call out the people around us into that calling, into that goodness, God. That we would be the type of church that helps the, the complete process of, of reformation and restoration, God. We receive your grace today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you need a few more minutes, we're going to go on break. Just go ahead and sit in your seats if you need a few minutes to just be with the Lord. Sometimes we just rush on to the next thing, but if you need a few minutes, go ahead and do that. Yeah, God bless you guys.